I want to tap into something else now. Is some of your recent work. So I remember seeing you on TV. And I don't know if you're allowed to talk about it, but I'm going to ask you about it anyway. So what were you doing in Anthony Joshua's corner? Ah, uh, well, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm one of Anthony Joshua's coaches. Um, AJ used to ask me questions, you know, um, and the, I'll tell you a funny one is that he used to ask me questions under an alias on Inst- on Instagram, and uh, people I, people weren't meant to know it was him, but somebody told me it was him. So he's asking me these questions, and I'm pretending he's he's pretending to be somebody else. somebody else, and I'm pretending that I don't know it's him, and I'm just replying to these questions, and it was quite comical at the time. So we're back at the HQ Windmill Boxing Team. It's uh, the Punchline Podcast. It's all about Mike, body and soul. So today we've got um, a local boxing coach, um, quite famous in the sport for a number of reasons. Famously known as the Barefoot Runner. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but without any further talking from me, I'm going to ask him to introduce himself. Uh, My name is Joby Clayton. And um, I'm a boxing coach in Wolverhampton. I also teach um, a number of other combat sports, um, Thai boxing, K1 fighting, and um, I've got a guy in the UFC as well. So uh, predominantly stand-up martial arts as well as boxing. It's all-round combat. So tell us about the gym. What's it called and what the logo stands for? Oh, well, we um, the gym is Firewalker. And that's um, started off by Kirkwood Firewalker, who was a, who is um, a martial artist. And uh, he was five times world Thai kickboxing champion um, in the early 90s. And um, Kirkwood had a, or Kirkwood was part of a, an amazing group of young guys who basically taught themselves Thai boxing. Um, in the 80s and uh, that was from a gym called Trojan and that was in an inner city area of Wolverhampton and those guys fought all over the world they did absolutely unbelievable things in um, in combat sport and uh, Kirkwood branched out and he is a an incredible businessman um, he's got incredible vision and his idea was to create a at the time, we called it a health club because um, we've been going now for a long time. Um, but it's like a fitness center and um, that's got a strong martial art ethos to it. Um, even the people who do fitness come in and they bow and, and show respect. And, um, and uh, Kirkwood wanted to have that martial arts. Would you influence. say it's like a way of life? Yeah. I mean, the martial arts should be a way of life. Okay. You know, it should be... So somebody who uh, who considers themselves a martial artist, um, there's a real way of life, there's an ethos to it. Um, and Kirkwood wanted to bring that to a wider audience in Wolverhampton, so he uh, set up Firewalker. And I think he's been running now for maybe 20 years. And um, I was one of the founding people that helped set it up. Um, and we run a... We run Thai boxing from there. We run um, an, an amateur boxing club from there. Um, but lots of fitness classes, you know, and um, and lots of other great things going on there. So for yourself, where do you actually fit into the hierarchy of the coaching side of things? Well, um, I started off as an assistant manager there. Okay. And then took over the... Um, management role with Kirkwood who was Kirkwood's the managing director um I've recently stepped away from that and although I still teach classes I still teach um the I'm still the head coach at Wolverhampton Boxing Club uh, sorry the uh, Firewalker Boxing Club um but I've also got other other things going on that that took me away and meant that I couldn't commit as much as I would like to at Firewalker so um, now I teach classes there and have stepped away from the management side of things. So in, through your journey, 
what has been the most standout moment or experience at the Firewalker Centre? Um, it's a good little question. Or well, has there been more than one? Yeah, I wouldn't say there's been. I wouldn't say there's been one. I mean, really, Kirkwood has. Um, it's it's a fascinating thing because we have put on Thai boxing shows, and and we've got we've had um, Thai boxers who've fought all over the world on the highest stages, on the biggest stages in in the world, and the the fan base that we created. The um, they really came just to just to support the local personality. You know, it was a marvelous thing. Like we had a we had a young fighter called Kerif Bella, and he fought in Japan. Um, Dre Grosh has also fought in Japan on some of the biggest shows that kickboxing can can produce. Um, and Kirkwood had this vision of bringing martial arts to a wider audience, and and we've got seventy odd year old ladies who've never been to a boxing show or a Thai boxing show, but they come and support the the athletes who are there and, and they get to know them personally. And there's a real special thing about that, you know, we're creating Kirkwood in particular has created these um, local heroes and, and pillars of the community. And that's something that I am really um, passionate about creating these pillars of the community. Um, and especially, you know, we spoke off camera about it, but the, the 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 way the way the world can come across now, we really need to have these young pillars of the community who are role models in every way, and that's that's kind of that's kind of where martial arts comes in, even into boxing. You know, boxing is often not considered a martial art, but it should be considered a martial art. It's a discipline, and the guys who do it. Um, should conduct themselves in a certain way and should follow a certain code um, because they are looked at by so many um, vulnerable and influential uh, people. So, and you talked about Japan and some of the large uh, martial arts tournaments. Talk us through what, what the structure is in the martial arts world. What are the bodies that put these competitions together? Where is the uh, competitors coming from? Um and how did you actually face up against the rest of the world? Um, well, I started coaching Kirkwood. Kirkwood was, um, he was a top flight martial artist without necessarily even having a individual coach. And at the time I was a professional boxing coach and um, I started to work with Kirkwood. He was fighting. He, Kirkwood was a social worker. And he took a few years off social work um, to pursue his uh, martial arts in, in the K1 in Japan, which was um, an unbelievable spectacle. I mean, those guys were fighting in front of 60,000 people at the Tokyo Dome. Um, and, you know, when, when the K1 kickboxing was on Japanese TV, it would be on both the major channels. So it was the equivalent of it being on the BBC and ITV on one night, you know, such a popular thing. And the first time that I went to Japan with Kirkwood, he got off the airplane. As soon as he got off the airplane, people were pointing at him and asking for his autograph. And it was a, a special, it's a special time in any, any martial artist's life. Um, never mind kickboxing, because kickboxing is a very hard sport to, to get that kind of, um, fame and accolades from um so yeah that, that, that was a special thing and the k1 at the time in japan if i'm talking about the k1 in japan it, it had some of the best fighters from all over the world so in the k1 is basically the full contact isn't it um it's stand-up martial arts yeah it's, there's certain blows that are not allowed but majority of the shots are allowed aren't they yeah it's not as it's not as a brutal maybe is the right word it's not as brutal as thai boxing uh, muay thai in thailand yeah. um but because heavyweights were doing it it was still pretty savage you know it's still knees to the head roundhouses and um it certainly had in in the early 90s uh, sorry, yeah, early 90s, late 90s. It was an unbelievable spectacle. It was a real... Because the memory I have from K1 is there was a certain tall fighter from the Netherlands. Peter Ertz. 
and he was quite quite good with his legs. He could kick really well. Okay, that's the memory I have. Okay, and yeah. I remember it was quite compared to boxing, where boxing, especially amateur boxing, is quite regulated. It's more about technique, and this was more about who is the toughest guy mm -hmm. in that ring and can remain standing. Basically, boxing people quite often look at it like that. I do think there's a real that there is a real art that can be that can be. Um, practiced and crafted in, in K1 fighting and kickboxing and in Thai boxing. You know, I mean, some of the Thai boxers are unbelievably skillful. You know, some of the Thai boxers in Thailand, they start off at the age of six, their parents take them to the gym, they live in the gym. Um, and some of them have like 400 Thai boxing fights. You know, their skill level is incredible. Uh, one of the best amateur boxers that I ever saw um, was a Thai who won the gold medal in the Olympic Games. And before he won the Olympic Games, he had 400, over 400 Thai boxing fights. You know, his skill level was just incredible. His judgment of distance, his timing um, was, you know, it was, it was throwback stuff. You know, it was like boxers, I know, um, we, you know, like, my godson Benjamin, he's had maybe a hundred fights, but uh, back in the day, you know, you could have a professional who could have a hundred fights and those, those were 15 round fights. So the equivalent ring experience that those guys had was just, um, it was on a different level compared to nowadays. So from the achievement point of view, Firewalker um, Fitness, what other kind of champions have produced? Because there's quite a few, isn't there? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously Kirkwood came up um, and Kirkwood set up the gym. Kirkwood was five times world tie boxing champion. Um, Peter Crook was um, a very good fighter from Wolverhampton as well. Um, at one point he was pound for pound the best tie boxer in this country for a long time. And he was one of the few um, fighters at the time that could live with the international fighters. And uh, Peter was a Peter is a policeman, um, so he was he was doing Thai boxing as a part time thing, whereas he's fighting full time fighters. So for him to be competing at that level, almost as a hobby, um, shows you that he obviously had immense ability. You know, Winston Walker, not related to Kirkwood, but um, Winston came into Thai boxing at the age of twenty nine, and he had a fantastic career. Um, I think he retired when he was about 42, but he was still fighting at, at the you know the highest level. Um, incredible. And then, That's quite late for, for any combat sport, absolutely, 42. Absolutely, absolutely. But um, the thing with Winston Walker was that um, he had an incredibly sh strong mind and he was physically very strong. You know, physical strength is one of the last things that quite often fighters lose. Um, he was a very, very powerful man. Um, and then those were kind of the early days. Um, Firewalker itself, um, my wife, Michelle Clayton, um, she was formerly Michelle Newell. She was a world um, Thai boxing champion. And um, Kerif Bella, um, Dre Grosh, those were all um, top fighters. I probably missed out a few, but um, yeah. So looking back at all the fighters, how many of them are still involved with, with the place now? Um, some of them, Michelle is a fitness instructor there. She's a personal trainer. Um, Kareth, he, I think the, he kind of goes out to Thailand, lives in Thailand for a bit, comes back to England. And um, Dre Grosh, she's a personal trainer. So they're still... They're still feeding back there. Yeah, they're still feeding back. And, um, you know, it's like I say, Kirkwood really did create this um, wonderful community um, for the community of Wolverhampton. And, um, you know, so... Yeah, there's some real, some real positive people coming out of Firewalker. And from the the building point of view, or the design and the function of the building, as a coach, throughout your experience, what in that gym has been vital, like in terms of design, access, equipment, and what would you change? Uh, well, I mean, when when we opened up, it was a state of the art fitness center. We at the time we were trying to compete with um, health clubs. Okay. Um, personally, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't probably go down that route again. 
because right now you've got budget gyms that yeah. churn out. Um, you just can't compete. No, yeah. you can't compete. You can't compete with a 999 gym uh, that's got... But, but the difference is the 999 gym is not producing the X amount of world champions, community champions, pillars of the community. Absolutely. So that's where the money is. Absolutely. The 999 doesn't produce the quality that you've produced in, in Firewalker Fitness. And absolutely. And that and that is the thing that, the, the the thing that you are buying into is the is the expertise and the family yeah like absolutely. the togetherness that I get from what you've just told absolutely. me absolutely everybody relies on everybody and it all comes together as one big picture yeah yeah absolutely I mean expertise is a big thing um, exuberance is a big thing you know just to be around positive people is just a massive massive thing you know people have such small circles in in their lives you know. Um, and Firewalker now is is a real positive, such a positive part in many people's circle, you know. And uh, I mean, even today I was messaging a lady who's 75 and I was training a young guy who's an up-and-coming boxer who's 20-odd years old and, you know, and talking to young kids. It's, it's a real positive thing right the way through the community. So going back to facilities, you said you wouldn't do it like a mainstream gym. What would you do different? Um, I think, I think really for Firewalker, it's all about our classes. Um, our classes are, are, are like, even the fitness classes. I mean, we do yoga classes, we do circuit training classes. Um, and then we do the boxing and the martial arts as well. And that's really why people come to Firewalker is, is our classes. And that's where, that's where they really get that community feel. That's where they get the friendship. Um, and everybody, I mean, you know, we pride ourselves that everybody works hard. Would you say that, like, you've got um, some type of activity for everyone? Everyone can tap into something different. Is it quite diverse, the, tra- the, the exercises Absolutely. on offer? Absolutely. We have, we have young kids who are five years old who are coming into martial arts for the first time. Um, and they are learning about fitness. They're learning about healthy eating. They're learning about um, discipline, self-discipline. They're learning, um, and they're, they're, they're just learning to get on with other people, you know, and then, but it goes right the way from five. And then our oldest member, I'm, I think he's about, I'm not even sure how old he is, maybe 85 or something like that, you know, just fantastic, you know, 85 uh, year old who does two fitness classes a day, you know, I mean, you, it's, fantastic, it's, it's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, we got one lady she took up fitness when she was 69 years old and then she's running half marathons when she's 80, you know? I mean, it's... it's Unheard of. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's just so positive. So I was going to ask you about the structure in martial arts. My understanding or my experience, I've had friends who've run martial arts clubs. They almost have a, a really good positive structure, especially with the belts, especially in karate, where a young person knows what they're aiming for and they know if they've achieved it and they have grading where they have to attend and perform in front of the sensei or uh, a teacher or a coach, and they have to hit that level before the next level is revealed to them. As a boxing coach, we don't really have that. And I, I'm of the personal opinion. It's just a personal opinion. I stand to be corrected. We should have something in place where if a kid comes in, they should know um, basic exercises like press-ups, sit-ups, squats, because there's so many boxers that I've coached who have been at a good level of experience where they've had 15 to 20 fights. And if you look at their press-up, it'll make you cringe because it's not correct. And um, we don't have that structure where we can give them, let's say, uh, maybe a, a badge for the shorts. You know, you've hit the basic level, you get a gold badge. You hit the next level up, you get a platinum badge. You hit the next level up, you get, you know, emerald badge. Maybe as coaches, we should come together and put something together. It's very hard, you know, it's very hard. In El, at Firewalker, we don't have a grading system either. Um, in Because we consider the strongest martial art at Firewalker is Thai boxing, and Thai boxing is, they don't have a grading system. It's, it's really about um, competing or it's about the art itself. Um, and it, it's a great question, and it's it, there. There are positives for it. Um, for instance, I, I teach a kids class on a Saturday, and a lot of parents come in and they say, "You know, my son 
when does he go for his first belt? And, and I say, well, I don't really want him to do a belt. I want him to enjoy martial arts. I want him to enjoy fitness. I want him to enjoy healthy eating. Um, I want him to enjoy this, this group and how the children interact. And, um, so it's more athlete focused. It's more about the experience that you're giving to that person. It's certainly more about the experience. Absolutely. It's certainly more about the experience just because Kirkwood, Kirkwood is, is such a um, figurehead in, in martial arts that we wouldn't want to, you know, you, you, you could give somebody a black belt and then they might go off and, and make a name off your name. Yeah. You know, um, they might go off and do something that isn't befitting of a martial artist or a pillar of the community. Like defamation of character. Yeah. Or something like that. So, and that, that's, that's a real strong thing for us. You know, we, we want, we, we want to keep it as real as possible. Um, and that is either you see yourself as a lifelong martial artist or you see yourself as a competitor who um, competes and, and, you know, works their way up and tries to compete at the highest level. Um, but you are, there is an argument for having a grading system as long as you can keep the integrity. And we've always found that it's very hard for us to keep the integrity in the martial art. Okay. And earlier on, you touched about uh, you had a pro coaching badge and that was boxing. So tell us what different disciplines you actually teach and what your recent activities be? Okay, so, I mean, I started off as, a, as an amateur coach and I would say that, you know, that is a real strong passion of mine to work with um, dedicated amateurs. Um, I recently came back into professional boxing um, after about 10 years. Um, I also, through Kirkwood, I became a Thai boxing coach and um and a kickboxing coach and the last few years also i've been working with mma guys you know mma is all the it's all the ufc the ufc yeah. well yeah. yeah um i'm flying off to dubai um shortly um for one of my fighters is making a ufc debut so yeah that that discipline um of mixed martial arts yeah so um but boxing remains the um remains my number one thing you know okay so obviously I know a little bit about the running and the barefoot running. So tell us the concept and how it started and how you sort of like share that with everyone. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's funny cause somebody said they, they saw a post, somebody posted on Facebook the other day, this crazy soul, they video running barefoot and then, you know, somewhere down in the comments, it says, yeah, that's Joe B. Clayton. He's a boxing coach, blah, blah, blah. And, um, but, um, I used to run as a kid. I used to run, you know, maybe up until about 25 and then I got a calf injury and every time I tried to go back to running, my calf would flare up. And, um, and then when I was about 40, I really wanted to get back into running and, um, I'd read a few little things on barefoot running and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. The first day I, I, um, I opened the door. I was just about to leave my house and my wife said, where do you think you're going? And I said, oh, I'm just, just going for a run. She said, what, what barefoot? And I said, yeah, I'm just going to try it. So I, I ran down the road and, and the road was very, um, very rough. Rugged. Yeah, yeah, very rugged. My wife got a phone call from the neighbor saying, is your husband okay? And we've just seen him running down the road. <laughs> but, um, but you know what? I was running down the road and it just felt fantastic. And, um, I, I did it for about five minutes and my one calf muscle, you have a calf muscle, um, underneath your main calf muscle, you have this muscle called your soleus and my soleus just locked up as though I'd never used it before. And, um, I kind of went home and I styled it out to my wife. I was pretending, I was pretending I was fine and I was just going to try it once. And I went out the next day and my other calf muscle locked up. My other soleus just tightened up as though I'd never used it before. And I thought, you know what? There's something to this. There's something to how, I, how the difference, if you haven't got shoes on, it makes you run completely different. The sole of your foot is telling your brain 
to move in a completely different way than if you've got a shoe on. And I just thought that that was something magical, that normally when we learn something, we learn it in our brain first, and then that kind of filters down into our body. But my foot, the bottom of my foot was educating my brain how to move, how to shock absorb. Um, how to run incredibly lightly and incredibly efficiently. And I just thought there's some magic here. And um, now I find, I just cannot believe that more people don't do it because um, the, because I am unable to put my foot down on, um, you know, concrete or tarmac hard, my body has to learn to shock absorb as I run. I have to run lightly. I have no choice. And um, consequently, I don't get injured um, half as much as um, I certainly did do in the past. And uh, also, it stimulates the brain. You are always constantly engaged in the ground. So whereas before, if I had a shoe on and I'd say to myself, I'd want to get fit and I'd think to myself, okay, I'm a fire walker. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to run home tonight. And I get to the top of the road about 400 meters and I would swear I'd be having this heart attack. Um, I'd swear there'd be something physically wrong with me, why I couldn't run. And it was just that I was disengaged. All I was thinking about was stopping. And so many Boxers do this, you know, so many boxers. It's a mental block, isn't yeah, it? So yeah, so many boxers hate the idea of running. They loathe it. Um, and now, because I'm constantly engaged with the ground, I'm constantly engaged in my environment, um, I absolutely love it. And, um, um, you know, without sounding evangelical about it, you know, when I'm running and, and uh, you know, every now and again I'll run, Normally I run between three and five miles, but every now and again I'll do 10 to 15 miles and you, it's just an absolute blissful experience. I can't believe more people don't do it. See, I obviously, um, part of my coaching and part of my education, I studied anatomy and physiology and there is some science behind that one pair of trainers cannot fit everybody's foot. So a lot of people get injuries because they have the wrong footwear on. And whatever reason they have for buying that footwork, whether it's cost factor or style factor or a bit of both, I find a lot of young students that come into the boxing club, they come with the wrong footwear. And when you mention about injuries, I think some of the injuries actually stem from poor footwear. But when you say wrong footwear, in my opinion, we shouldn't have any footwear on because, you know... I, for tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, people have had no footwear. Well, even currently, if you look at sort of the animal kingdom, Absolutely. some of the fastest predators and the most agile predators, none of them wear their Nike, Absolutely. Nike Air Force Ones. Absolutely. And we have tens of thousands of nerve endings on the bottom of our feet. And they're not there for, you know, they're not just there for joke. They're there to, to um, connect with the ground. And they're there to communicate and, you know, and it really helps us. I find it a magical experience um, to run barefoot and to move barefooted, to be fair. And, you know, martial arts, Thai boxing, they train barefoot. Um, you can see boxers in Cuba. There are boxers in the Cuban national team. You train barefoot. They, they train barefoot. They, they, don't, they don't have any shoes, you know, and... Um, and they're whopping, they're whopping people with the, the flashiest um, pair of shoes on. And um, I just think, I just think it's, a, it's a fascinating topic. But what do we do? For instance, the foot is a, is a wonderful piece of technology. It's an incredible piece of technology, you know. Um, and so if we support it, if we stabilize it, we take away its own magic. We take away its responsibility. It's almost like... It goes lame. Yeah, it's almost like if we put a cast on our arm, you know, when we break our arm and we put a cast on it, but when we take that cast off, then the muscle has... Um, shrunk. Yeah, the muscle shrunk and it, and it becomes weak and then we have to build it back up again. And it's like, when I, was, when I started this journey, I was thinking, you know, wow, you know, 
obviously my for instance, my my calf muscles aren't used to this my ankles aren't used to this my the, the muscles in my feet aren't used to this and um it's just so there was just so many things that i was just thinking this is incredible so many so many lights were going off in my mind you know um that it was that it was stimulating something um, fascinating i think it is fascinating yeah, yeah. I also think, like from my personal experience, every time I've been abroad on a beach, I've done a lot of runs on the beach and I find it therapeutic as well, especially on sand. But obviously sand's a lot softer than walking and running on normal ground. But I think, like you said earlier, it's a message coming from the sole of your foot to your mind and educating you to trust the body to work differently. I honestly see it as a, it's, a, it's an ancestor's joy. I honestly see it as it's something that our ancestors did and it's, it's, part, of, it's, it's part of the magic that we've lost, you know, to run on sand or to run on grass. Um, there's something absolutely magical in it. That communication from your feet, um, there's something really, really special about it, in my opinion. Okay, so go, we'll go back to the coaching side. Tell us about amateur boxing, what you like about amateur boxing, what you dislike, some of the champions you've worked with, your method, how you would take... Uh, a beginner and the journey through to the top level okay well I, I find it interesting I don't actually like boxing um, and people often talk about their love of boxing I see boxing as like the sea I think that if you're sitting on the shore and you look at the sea it's beautiful and everything but if you're actually in it or on it then you have to have a completely different amount of respect for it and I think that boxing is like that. I love boxers who are dedicated and want to further themselves. And that's where my passion comes in. Um, you know, not so much the, the sport of boxing, never mind the business of boxing. Um, my passion comes from developing dedicated boxers and helping those, helping those um, helping those athletes navigate their way through boxing. Um, and that's, that's really where, that's like the cornerstone of my coaching. Um, that's, how I want to, that's how I want to see it. And, um, you know, rather than furthering the sport itself, I think boxing is an incredibly brutal. And Unforgiving. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lonely. It's, 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 it's so tough. It's so tough. And, and those things, don't get me wrong, those things are why we hold it in such high esteem. Um, and the brutality of it, this, you know, it, it gives us that respect for anybody who, who has a go at it. Never mind the people who can excel at it, you know. The boxers who can excel at it, um, they have to give so much um, dedication. They have to give so much of their own energy. Um, I think sacrifice is the wrong word, but they have to really give so much of their time and their life in order to make it look half easy, you know, or even to make it look half hard. Um, but even to be successful at it, they have to really dedicate themselves to it. And, and that's where I, that's where my passion lies in helping those people navigate their way through the sport. So I became a coach at a young age. I was, a, I, I became a coach. This is actually 30 years. Um, I've been coaching now. Um, I was started off coaching at the age of 18. I coached, um, in Wolverhampton amateur boxing club and, um, I was a junior coach there. I wouldn't necessarily say I knew what I was doing. Um, but I had a certain passion for it. Um, and what I really, what I did as a young coach is I invested in videos of amateur boxing. This was way before the internet. Um, boxing was rarely on the television. We're talking VHS. We're talking, we are talking VHS and beta. Yes, we absolutely. Um, and, uh, I invested in videos of amateur boxing and off the back of that, I started to realize and the Cubans would, were doing something that was kind of different. It was kind of different to, to the, you know, the, the Americans had that um, almost professional style to their amateur boxing where they had these incredible talents, you know, um, and I'm talking late 80s now. So 
the Americans had this um, they had this wave of talent that came off the back of Muhammad Ali, and uh, you know the Americans were following on from that. Um, so the American style was this. It, it was it was almost talent based. Um, they had great coaches as well. The Americans had great teachers in the in the eighties, um, um, but they had amazing talent. Obviously, they had this fast pool of people that they could come from. Whereas the Cubans had a small pool of people. I think in the nineteen eighties, Cuba was maybe eight to ten million people strong. Um, but they just seemed to be able to produce champion after champion. They were doing something completely different. European boxers were kind of stiff. They were kind of awkward. It looked almost military what the European boxers were doing. They had this military style to them, straight back, um, very disciplined. Like I said, the Americans had this flamboyant thing coming off the back of Muhammad Ali and maybe Sugar Ray Leonard, people like that. And then the Cubans had this, they almost had this blend of the two. They had this um, Caribbean rhythm. Um, but then they also had the, the technique of the European and they managed to blend the two together with the athleticism that came, came from the Caribbean as well. And so I followed that. And I remember in the 92 Olympics, myself and um, Benjamin's dad, I, 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 we, we were watching this super heavyweight from Cuba and there's a super heavyweight called Roberto Bellado. And he was a short Cuban. Now, most of the Cubans were really tall. Most of them, you know, in Cuba, they, they have this Soviet system where they look to take the kids from a young age and they look to talent spot at a young age. And they would look for tall, strong um, kid children who are, who are fast and they would look to turn them into boxers. I mean, the fascinating thing about a lot of Cuban boxers is they didn't want to be boxers. They would. They were in, nurtured. Yeah, they yeah. were instructed. You know, the, their parents told your son's to go into a boxing school, and and, and that's how they. It's that's compulsory. how it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, even top flight fighters like Teofilio Stevenson, he never really wanted to be a boxer per se. You know, and um, Felix Savon, he he wanted to be a rower, but they deemed you know you're going to be a boxer and this that and the other, but. But myself and Tony, we were watching this super heavyweight and this super heavyweight just did not get hit. He was, um, he was only six foot tall. His nickname was um, Chubby because he was quite chubby. But he had the best footwork. He had ring IQ for days. Um, he was just making all of these boxers miss, outmaneuvering them, outthinking them. Um, pinging them at the time it was Olympic scoring, you know, it was that point scoring system where they pressed a buzzer. So he would hit them with a shot and then move away and hit them again and create an angle and, and just poetry, absolute poetry. And, and something again went off in my mind, whereas I, I watched this guy and all of a sudden I'm watching this Cuban who's got great technique, but he's got some flair, he's got personality, um, not necessarily as gifted as other guys, but obviously very, very hardworking, very, very intelligent. And something just went off on, in my mind and I realized, okay, this is what I need to be teaching. This is, this is, this is, how, this is how it should be, you know? Um, and um, uh, Benjamin Whitaker, who's my godson, his father at the time, Tony, he was one of my boxers. And I said, listen, this is how we're going to do it, you know. And, and Tony was a big Muhammad Ali fan anyway, so it kind of made sense um, that, and it kind of made sense when I watched Roberto Ballado, this Cuban box, it kind of made sense why Muhammad Ali was in the rhythm that he was in because Muhammad Ali was all about rhythm, whereas a lot of boxers are all about technique, but they don't have any rhythm. Muhammad Ali was all about rhythm and he didn't necessarily have the greatest of technique. He kind of got away with a lot of things because he was such a, because he was, you know, such an athlete. But watching these, watching these young Cubans, we saw the rhythm and we saw the technical and tactical ability and it kind of, it, it inspired me to, be, to, to wish to coach boxers like that, you know, so... That's that's kind of where it all started for me. So the the rhythm is that something natural or is that something 
your coach. Is there an influence of music with that? Or It doesn't need to be music. I basically look to coach three different rhythms. Um, I look to coach the rhythm of the breath. I think breath work is so underappreciated in all walks of life. Um, the way that we breathe, I think that it's going to be, it's an avenue that is so untapped for athletes, but also just our general health, the way that we breathe um, to manage stress, to manage anxiety, um, to get our brains to be operating on a certain wavelength. Um, it, it, to me, that's a fascinating thing. So I teach a lot of rhythm in breath and then I teach rhythm in footwork and the rhythm of the footwork kind of helps the boxer relax it puts them into a nice place where they are able to uh, move efficiently. And I talk, I talk to boxers about grace. And um, grace can be seen as something that is just there for looks. But in the animal kingdom, every wild animal moves with grace. And they move with grace in order to be efficient and to be effective. Um, it's for there for their very survival. And if we watch top athletes like Muhammad Ali, like Roberto Bellardo, but also in, in other walks of life, you know, maybe Marcel Sedan or, or um, you know, amazing runners. We watch amazing runners and they are running. They, they, all, they run with such grace. We can't believe the speed that they're, they're running at. We can't believe the efficiency that they are able to generate. And um, so this is part of where the rhythm comes in. Um, so we've got the rhythm of the breath, we've got the rhythm of the footwork, and then we've got the kinetic chains and the rhythm of the punches. Um, many people think, for instance, many people think if we, if we look at a karate punch, it's a very stiff punch and um, it's almost like an iron bar. Whereas if you watch a Cuban punch, they punch almost effortlessly and it's like a ball and chain. The, the, the weight of the punch is right at the end of the punch and they've developed this amazing kinetic chain of energy. I, I, I liken it to a tsunami wave. Um, you know, sometimes you watch these programs and they show a tsunami wave on the, telev on, on, the, on the TV and you can kind of see something on the horizon, but you don't quite know what it is. And it's only when it actually hits, you. hits the earth, yeah, it hits the shore that the power is, is, is understood. And um, so we develop this rhythm of kinetic energy. Um, and again, if you, if you look at the, the great boxers, they kind of have this efficiency and this effectiveness to the way that they punch. Um, Roberto Duran is one of the best examples of this. If you, if you see Roberto Duran box, he, he could generate incredible effect in his punches at the same time as being incredibly efficient um, and being very, very relaxed. I remember one time Roberto Duran was asked... Um, does he hate the opponent? And he says, there's no way I can hate the opponent because if I hate the opponent, then that just creates tension in my body and I have to relax in order to be able to perform, you know? So he's kind of, he's almost creating this, um, this illusion. He's almost creating this illusion. And, and I talk to boxers about creating that illusion. You know, the illusion is for the fans, it looks like you're just fighting, but how can you come out of a 12 or a 15 round fight like Duran and be completely unmarked? You, you haven't even got scratches from the gloves or the laces, you know, and that, that takes an incredible amount of poise um, and it takes an incredible amount of intelligence, what we call ring IQ. Um, so watching these Cubans from these videos, that kind of, that, that kind of just spurred me, okay, that is how I'm going to have to teach boxing because I, I recognize that boxing is incredibly brutal. Um, it's such a hard sport. It's, it's so lonely that in order for me to justify being a teacher, in order to me just to, to justify being as obsessed as I am about it, you know, um, I have to be compassionate to those boxers and teach it that way. 
see the, the the key point from there as well is obviously the videos the study so before you implemented anything you studied it and you made that recognition that this works and you broke it down and then you adopted the skills and I think a lot of coaches including myself we actually don't do that as often as we should and I think self-reflection is another thing so when we coach we're obviously giving feedback um and breaking down performance from our athletes but are we doing that to ourselves? as a coach yeah. it's, it's vital it's yeah. vital and that's something I will take away from this conversation and I will reflect on myself you mentioned about um, can, can I can I just can I just come into that it's an interesting point um, and, and that reflection for instance I video a lot of my sessions and as much as I look at the boxer I also look at how I teach and I'll give you a I'll give you an example Sometimes I get carried away and, you know, we, us, us coaches, we do a lot of pad work and sometimes I get carried away and I find myself moving the pad towards the punch. Now, why does a boxing coach move the pad, the boxing pad towards the punch? Shouldn't do it, I don't think. But why do they? Why do we? And I find myself doing this every now and again. I get carried away and I find myself doing it. Now, the, one of the most important skills that a boxer can have is judgment of distance, yeah. is to make this, his opponent or her opponent miss by millimeters and to be able to counter back. That is one of the most important skills. But I find myself every now and again moving the punch to moving the pad towards the punch. Now, the only reason I'm doing that is because I want to make that punch sound better than it really is. Okay. So I'll be watching, I'll be watching myself on, on, uh, on, on a video. I've got, Joby, hold that damn pad still, please. Because that's so important. If I can read when my opponent is going to throw, when my boxer, sorry, is going to throw that punch, then their opponent can read when they're going to throw that punch. You understand? So I must keep that pad still. And keep it real. In order to, for it to be as real as possible, you know, because if I can read it, the opponent can read it. Just sorry just to, to cut you, but that's, a, that's an example of, of using that self-reflection. Um, and... Most punches, sorry, most boxers, most coaches that we watch nowadays, they're always moving the pad towards the punch. Yeah, I've, I've noticed a lot of boxers who look really well on the pads, well-rounded and they, they look excellent on the pads, but when the bell goes, they don't look as good. And that's probably what it is. Well, that, it's not real. That, that's one of the reasons why it can happen. You know, I mean, we want the boxers to feel good. You know, we want to feel good ourselves. You know, I, I always find it quite, I was, I, I'm always amused. I'm always in the changing rooms and I'm quite amused because what we get in the changing rooms is we get the boxer who's just about to go into the fight, but he knows everybody's watching him. This is the moment for the coach to get into, you know, to show other coaches what he's got. Yeah, who's the best coach <laughs> in the changing room? Who's yeah. the best, exactly. And, um, and, and it's, a, it's a bit of comedy because not only is the coach pushing the pad forward, He's also making a sound as, he's, as the punch is landing. Why is the coach making a sound? I mean, I don't really understand why the boxer's making a sound, to be fair. The boxer makes a sound to punch, in my opinion, just to make the punch sound harder. Then they're moving the pad towards. Then the it's coach just amplifying is, everything. Yeah. Absolutely. It's amplifying something that isn't necessary. It's really interesting because obviously... I see a lot of coaches and nowadays I'm, I'm judging a lot of shows and refereeing and sometimes the technique level or, you know, the level of athlete, they shouldn't be in the ring. And it comes back to, it's down to the coach to make that decision. And I think one of the most difficult decisions I'm guilty of making in the past, throwing the towel in. So from, from a coaching, purely coaching perspective, no bias, tell us when you've had to throw a towel in and how it made you feel and why you did it. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't think you, in amateur boxing, if a boxer gets injured, if, sorry, if a, if a boxer goes over and gets a count, they're possibly, they're probably going to lose the fight on points anyway. It's only a three round fight, isn't it? You know, um, I mean, I'll tell you the truth of it is I beat myself up for not throwing the towel in. 
and I beat myself up for not throwing the towel in quick enough, not the other way around. You know, if I've, if I have thrown the towel in or if I've, uh, you know, um, pulled my boxer out in between rounds, then I can live with that. But I find it very, very hard to live with the fact that, you know, my boxer might have been beaten and I, I wished that I'd thrown the towel in. See, from, from a referee's point of view, there's been times where I've stepped in and I've called a halt to the bout after a count where I've deemed the boxer not fit enough to continue or they just don't want to continue when you ask them if they're okay and they just shake their head. Obviously, you get a lot of stick from coaches and I, don't, I know they don't mean it in a bad way and it's just passion. But to drill that understanding in, the reason why we do it, the reason why coaches throw the towel in, the reason why referees retire boxers is purely for their benefit and purely to safeguard them from that punishment Absolutely. that they're receiving. Absolutely. So it's it's all a, it's a good gesture. It's it's a good hearted move, and it's to protect that person and stop them getting injured and to give them that uh, sort of lifespan in the sport and not getting hurt. And too many times I've seen coaches just give the wrong impression, the wrong reaction, and. I think we need to put a stop to that as coaches, officials, and as Absolutely. boxing people, Absolutely. ambassadors. Absolutely. We, we, uh, and we, we talk about things like heart. I don't want to see a boxer's heart. I don't want to, I don't, I, I don't, what do I want to see a boxer's heart for on a club show? I don't even want to see, I don't want to see a boxer's heart at all. I mean, great that they've got that in the bank, you know, um, great that a boxer can get knocked down and get up and win a contest, you know, and I've had boxers do that. You know, I've had boxers who have been hurt and I've almost gone there and I didn't and they've come back and they've won the fight. But those are, number one, they're going over and above. You know, they're, they're going over and above really what I'm asking them to do. Um, but really I would hope that we don't get to that point that they are winning the fight or, or losing the fight with, with that, without having to show heart, you know, without having to show a good chin, without having to show all these badges of honor that, that are wrapped up in, in the, in the machoism of the sport. So on the back of that, obviously is boxing a safe sport? But no, it's not. And that it goes, that goes back to my, um, the, the first thing that I said, I'm not a fan of boxing because it's not a safe sport. I'm a fan of boxers who dedicate themselves to it and, and look to navigate it because it's not safe. Okay. It is incredibly brutal. It can maim people. It does maim people and, and it can take their life, you know? Um, and that's why, that's why I liken it to the sea. You know, I think, I think that's, that's the analogy that I make of it. Um, and it deserves a tremendous amount of respect. Deserves a tremendous amount of respect from the boxer. You know, I struggle with boxers and I, I, I struggle with boxers who aren't dedicated. Um, and I struggle with, and by the same token, I struggle with people who say they love boxing, you know, because of what it can possibly do to somebody. So basically, if you don't give it the respect that it's due, it's going to hurt you or potentially kill you it, it can do it can do and it does uh, um, unfortunately I mean, we see it too often in, in, in especially in the pro game where even post boxing post performance athletes go away and they suffer depression mental health threats financial issues and it leads too often absolutely to suicide brutal. absolutely brutal the, the, the trauma is trauma you know and um, the trauma of boxing is absolutely brutal whether or not it happens whether or not that trauma is manifested on the night of the fight or six months down the line or six years down the line or 10 years down the line that, that, you know, you have to pay for that at some point, you know? So, uh, again, that goes back to, that goes back to this little jobby super heavyweight who wasn't getting hit, you know? And, and I said, no, that's the way that I must teach this sport. If I'm going to stay in this sport, if I'm going to, if I'm going to dedicate myself and, and I consider myself obsessed about coaching and obsessed about how to teach properly, um, if I'm going to do it, then I have to bring that compassion to my coaching, to my teaching. Let's go on to something slightly different now. So in your understanding, if there is a bad student, what is a bad student? Describe a bad student. 
we're not going to name and shame anybody, no. but <laughs> what is a bad student in this sort of field or this way of life? Well, there is no bad student. Um, there's just some people that, that, there's some people that do boxing for different, people do boxing for different reasons. You know, um, there is, there isn't a bad student really. There might be a boxer who talks about fighting, not really interested and they might even have a fight, but they're still not really interested. There might be a boxer who talks about becoming a champion. They're not really interested in, and our actions speak louder than our words, you know? Um, is it a matter of execution over elocution? <laughs> well, yes, unfortunately it is because uh, boxing's all about what you do. On the day? Yeah, well, but it's about what you do. The prep? All the preparation. The sacrifice. I use the term, I use this term over and over and I call it putting in the karma. And karma, all that karma is is energy. And if you put in the correct energy, then you, whatever you put in, that's the energy that you will be able to function at, you know? Um, and if you, in my opinion, if you align to a certain energy frequency, for instance, in the um, 100 meters in the Olympics, the 100 meters is the easiest example because it's a, it's a pretty steadfast thing. If you can align your physical and mental energy to being able to run 9.5 um, seconds for the 100 meters, you become the Olympic champion. That takes a certain amount of strength. It takes a certain amount of speed. It takes a certain amount of you know, elastic strength and all the other components to it. Um, but they've aligned that energy. And that's what has to happen in boxing. They have to align their energy to that energy frequency. If we take the top boxers, they can run the 100 meters a lot faster than the average boxer. They can run 1,000 meters a lot faster than the average boxer, you know. They can probably do more press-ups or this, that, and the other because they are able to align their energy frequency. Um, and that's all that putting in the karma means. It's all about the preparation. Now, people talk about talent and people talk about gifted boxers. We are gifted things by our ancestors, you know. Um, our ancestors might gift us a certain amount of height. They might gift us a certain amount of reach or a certain amount of um, muscle. Um, but then the ability is to take that talent, to take that gift. The ability is to then prepare it. And that's what ability is. Ability isn't gifted to you. You have to work for that ability, you know. And the top boxers, the great boxers, we can only guess at how hard they have had to work, you know, and had to prepare. Um, and, and again, I talk about my godson, Benjamin Whitaker. He is seen now as an incredibly gifted boxer. And it grates me because he's not a gifted boxer, you know. Yes, he had certain attributes from his ancestors, but he is so hard working. He is so dedicated. And he has been that way for at least a decade, you know. So anybody trying to catch up with him, trying to match his karma, they've got a, they've got a lot to do. You understand? Okay, and that's how I see it, um, you know. And as long as, as long as those guys carry on aligning their energy and aligning their karma, then they can't help but become successful. So the opposite to that is obviously... Give us an example of a good student. A good student yeah. um, is a, a person of vision, a person who can taste it right now, a person who can smell it right now, a person who has such blinkered determination and dedication. Um, that's a good student. That's somebody you can work with. Um, you know, that's... Vision is the greatest talent that a boxer can possibly have. You know, we, we talk about the, the, the person who goes to bed early, for instance. Um, in another podcast, you, you've, you've talked about running. Muhammad Ali ran at five o'clock in the morning, right? Muhammad Ali was that great 
1974, he was getting up at 4.30 in the morning and running at 5 o'clock in the morning. He was that great. He'd already been a pro for how many years? He'd have been an amateur for how many years before that? But his dedication, his vision, he knew what it took that he was getting up at 4.30 in the morning to go running, you know. Joe Fraser would get up at four, four o'clock in the morning because he knew he had to fight Muhammad Ali. <laughs> okay. Get up half an hour extra. These guys were different. These guys were different. They functioned on a different level. Okay. Nowadays, we got a guy, oh, I, I, I don't actually go running because I've got bad knees. I go for a bike ride in the, in the afternoon. Oh, you go for a bike ride in the afternoon, do you? Great. Okay, because that's it's it's a different it's a different it's easy animal. to make excuses. Yeah. It's a different animal we're dealing with, um, but yeah, vision is the greatest talent, the greatest gift that a boxer can have. And if somebody has that vision, and you know, with the vision, how early? Let's say you've got a young athlete. Uh, somebody's come to the gym for the early years, six, seven year old. Would you expect some sort of vision from that six year old? The beauty of it is. The six and the seven year old have a greater vision. Have a greater vision. Nothing is impossible to them kids. Okay. As they, as they mature, a seven year old boy is often as clever as he's going to be until he's about 30. It's normally a downward spiral after <laughs> about seven until he gets to about 30. Okay. It gradually works its way up because they have to go through that thing about being cool and, and, and all that nonsense that comes with um, adolescence and, and everything else. And then, um, you know, learning about life and in your early twenties, I mean, you know, young people, young people haven't got any life experience behind them, but the seven-year-old, they've got something different. They've got that sparkle in their eye that we as adults, we're trying to capture that back. We're trying to get that back. We lost that sparkle about seven or eight, and we're trying to get it back. Um, in, in, in my gym, I train um, Lloyd Hunnigan. I don't know if you remember Lloyd Hunnigan. He was, he was unified welterweight champion of the world. I train his grandson. His grandson is a, just this wonderful energy. Nothing is impossible to this kid. You know, he's there doing, he's doing press ups that I've never even seen. Okay. I've never even seen them because he's invented them. Okay. It's like one arm, one leg. And then he's kind of doing there and he bends over to the side and he, but he's come up with it himself, you know, because he's got this, he's got this vision. Yeah. He's got this incredible vision and he's got something magical to go along with it, which is exuberance. Okay. We lose the exuberance. All of a sudden we're paying the mortgage. All of a sudden we're doing all of these things. All of a sudden we want to be cool. We lose this exuberance that the young kids have and we try and get it back. Now, did Muhammad Ali lose his enthusiasm? No. Okay. Um, even Benjamin Whitaker, although he's this cool rapper, he's still got this enthusiasm. He's got this, he's got this thread in his personality that is different. It's on a different, it's on a different level. It's on a different level than, a, than, than, the average, than the average cat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. And these are traits of successful people. So going back to your thing, going back to your original question, um, I find that the young kids have that, you know, the young kids have something magical and they have play. Shadow boxing is basically play and shadow boxing should be play. Okay. And I'll say to the young kids, um, in, in class, I'll say, okay, then where are we today? And one kid will say, I'm in, Thailand. And I'll say, what are you doing? He said, I'm fighting for the world title. Okay. Because can you imagine what that, that, that's going to do for his... It's going to motivate the mentality. Yeah. Can you imagine what it's going to do? performance, yeah. Okay. Now that is living with vision. And the guys who don't lose it, the guys who keep that, yeah, those are the successful people because they train with a different energy and their energy frequency is on a different level. If we, you imagine most boxing gyms are freezing cold in the winter. And if a kid comes into a freezing cold gym and he doesn't really want to be there and he just goes through the motions, 
Is he ever going to attain that energy frequency? No chance. But if he comes into a gym, it doesn't matter where it is. But he hasn't got the clouds of his own conception weighing him down. Okay, he sees beyond those clouds. Or what's beyond the clouds? What is beyond the clouds? Stars. Sunshine or stars. Wow. Okay, sunshine or stars. That's beyond the clouds. Okay, so if he comes in with that, all of a sudden, he's got a totally different personality. He's got a totally different energy that they're coming with. And those are the successful people in life. And those are the successful boxers, in my opinion. And the successful coaches, by the way. So from the coaching point of view, share some of the vision as a coach. So you've talked about this energy that a seven-year-old would have. Mm -hmm. And to be successful, they've got to carry that vision yeah. throughout and not be afraid. Yeah. Or, or a, be afraid. Be afraid, but, but do it. But do it anyway. So as a coach, in, if I was in your shoes, what is the vision that I can see right now? Well, that's down to each individual. And that's the fascinating thing. And I was talking to this, I was talking about this with a world champion the other day. And I was talking, I was talking about this with a world champion the other day. And he, and he was saying that he doesn't feel he gets the respect. Okay. And I said, well, what is success to you? And he turned it back and he said, well, why did you ask me that question? I said, because whatever is success for you, that's what's going to fuel you. That's, that's the energy that is going to fuel you. If you see that if you see this as successful, and it might be to, to some young kid, it might be just to have one fight, okay? Another kid might see it um, as, as being the best in the country. And to somebody else, it might be to be the best in the world, you know? Um, from a young age, I've said that Benjamin Whitaker is going to be, he's going to be a, he's going to be a, hall, a hall of Fame fighter. He's not just going to be a world champion. He's going to be a Hall of Fame fighter. And that's our goal. That's our vision. Well, that's my vision for him anyway, whether he likes it or not. Okay. Um, that's my vision to make him a Hall of Fame fighter. Um, but it's different for each individual. You know, somebody might just come to the gym and they just want to gain confidence. Okay. Or they want to lose weight. Okay. So you, you help each individual depending on how they want to, depending on whatever their success is. So fr from a, a lead point of view, from a facilities point of view, what piece of kit do you like the most as a coach? And what teaches the most? What's the most in interactive? You're going to exclude pad work. Okay. Because pad work is everybody wants it. But when you're coaching in a session, a grassroots session with 30 individuals for yeah. an hour, yeah. you're not going to give the quality time to everybody. We understand the constraints, yeah. volunteers. First of all, time. first of all, pad work is a very small part of coaching that has become a very large part of coaching because it's so visual, okay? And it's, it's, complete, it's not necessary. Many, many great fighters never did pads. Muhammad Ali never did pads. Roberto Duran never did pads. Chavez only did pads later on in his career. Julio Cesar Chavez, who was a fantastic Mexican fighter, he only did pads later on in his career after he'd had about 70 or 80 pro fights. Um, they're not necessary. What is necessary is coaching. What is necessary is, is technical sparring. Um, I am a big believer in technical sparring. I'm not a believer in too much open sparring where people are getting punches or flying at them full pelt. Um, but a lot of technical sparring where we're working on situations over and over and over and over again. It's a repetition. Absolutely. The repetition of working with a partner. Um, and I think the magic of that is that they're learning to work and interact with a human being as well. So putting the sports aside, they're learning to communicate and they're learning to help bring that person along. The people skills. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, we go back to pillars of the pillars of the community, which I'm looking to develop, you know, is, is a young person working with an older person or an older person working with a younger person or an elite boxer working with a novice and how they interact and how they respect each other. Okay. So this is, this is a very important aspect. Going back to the sports side of things, 
I think that it's very important to work with a partner. I think we get wrapped up too much in um, fads, gimmicks, apparatus. I don't think it's necessary at all. Um, and if you had an open space and um, Kirkwood, uh, sorry, not Kirkwood, Benjamin spoke about his experience in Uzbekistan. Their national gym doesn't have a ring. Their national gym where they produce all these amazing world-class fighters doesn't have a ring. All they do is they get a uh, bandage and they tie it from one side of the room to the next side of the room and they do that and they, they square it off so there's about eight different rings in this one room and they say, okay, guys, let's go. Okay, isn't that magical? Okay, because really... I think that- it comes back to the point about vision. They've obviously got a vision that even if there's not a physical ring there, the space they can adopt, evolve and just use it as they want. And if you haven't got the equipment, the coach has to coach. What most coaches do, if we, if, if we look at the pads, and, and I, don't, I don't wish to be disrespectful to anybody, but in terms of furthering coaching, what most coaches talk about on the pads is the name of a punch or a number. So they'll hold this one up and they'll go jab. And they'll hold this one up and they'll go right hand. Now, we can teach three-year-olds that that's a jab. They don't need to be told that. They don't need to be told that this is a right hand. Okay. And then they don't need to be told, okay, then four and then six and then crazily 10. Okay. Nobody ever throws 10 punches nonstop. And if you do, then you need to be fighting somebody a little bit better. Yeah. You know, opponent should move after two. Yeah. So if you don't have the equipment, then all of a sudden the coach has no choice but to start coaching. Okay, start correcting footwork. And this is where this is where my obsession kicks in because I go into every little detail about how, for instance, the angle of the back foot, it needs to be on a certain angle. And the ball of the foot on the inner side needs to be on the floor, you know, and I really because everything has a point. Every you know, how the position that we hold the backhand, for instance. And if we just hold it an inch lower, it, it has so much connotations. If we hold it slightly in front, it has a completely different connotation. If I hold the backhand, for instance, if I hold it slightly in front of me, then I can defend a jab or a straight punch a lot easier than if I hold it to the side of me. Okay. And all these small little increments of coaching is what the box is what the coach must start to do if we don't have equipment like foam this and now we've got we've got all kinds of stuff that we can buy online at wonderful prices that aren't really going to help a boxer at all yeah i think it just makes the coach a little bit more on the back foot or on the back seat yeah if you just throw equipment out there and it's open to interpretation one coach will use the, the foam roller different another one will use it different yeah and sometimes I think some of the stars are to blame because they show these uh, promo videos Absolutely. where they're doing all sorts just to make a promo, but it's not actually what they're being coached. You've hit the nail on the head. Yeah. You've hit the nail on the head. I mean, I find it, I think it's so frustrating for a young boxer and young boxers, young boxers thirst to be taught. Okay. They thirst to be taught. They want to find out far more than coaches do. I get asked Probably, I, I get asked all the time on social media, what, what about this punch? What about that? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And it's always a boxer. It's not a coach asking me, okay? Because the coach is less likely to learn, which, which I just find tragic, you know? But the boxer's thirst to be taught, not to be trained, but to be taught. And that's, that's the difference. Because what's going to make an elite boxer isn't their VO2 max. It isn't how fast they can run. It's the quality of their craft. That's what's going to make an elite boxer, the quality of their craft, okay? Um, Because every boxer is tough to a certain level. Most boxers are fast. Most boxers are strong. But the quality of their craft is just going to take an elite boxer onto a different level. 
And that demands a hell of a lot of teaching to take that, to take the gifts and turn them into ability. So going back to being a coach, what is a coach? What are the different roles that you take on as a coach? Oh, there's so many roles, so, isn't there? Yeah, a lot, of the, a lot of people come to the gym, you know, parents will drop off youngsters, youngsters are coming to the gym. Uh, when we put boxing shows on, the fans come in yeah. and they just think the coach's job is an easy job. But tell us now, be quite honest, be brutal. What do you do as a coach on a day-to-day basis? Um, or in some cases you do everything, but yeah, teach, give us the brutal truth. Teach, what do you teach do? boxing a little bit. Yeah. Okay. No, but that's about 5% of our yeah, time. There's, yeah, there's so much to it. There's so much to it. I mean, you know, um, being a general teacher, you know, being a general teacher, raising, trying to get a young person to, or developing developing that um, that spark of curiosity. That's what a teacher needs to do. That's what a teacher really needs to do. They need to develop that spark of curiosity and really develop that in a young person or even an older person, okay? Rekindle that spark of curiosity that's going to, that's going to turn, in terms of boxing, what it's going to do is it's literally going to create a genius, okay? A genius is only somebody who has followed their curiosity on and on and on and on and on. And they be, you know, they've, they've aligned that karma to that level, okay? They've took that curiosity just to a different level. Um, but that's one aspect, you know? I mean, we are, you could say we're social workers to a lot of people. Um, we are father figures to a lot of people. We're best friends to a lot of people. We're mentors. Um, we're counselors to a lot of people, you know, the amount of people that I'm trying to teach them boxing and they, they want me to counsel them about their life and this, that, and the other, but we take on so many roles. Okay. Hopefully we can be pillars of the community. I was going to talk about something that's relative to what you just said. It's the story of Mike Tyson as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason he became the way he became because his coach, well, famous coach took him in almost like his own son and nurtured that talent and kept telling him that you will be and you can be and you should be and it's a matter of time and obviously Mike Tyson is one of the most amazing boxers that we've seen in recent times and I think the important part is the social part you said being a social worker obviously these young people boys girl girls um, men and women they can go through tough times they can make mistakes and that isn't necessarily the end of the line. You can still come back and you can still make a positive change and bounce back to your success. And I think it's all about realigning the focus for that spark and pushing and pushing and being obsessed with that success. And like you said, it's all about sacrifice, working hard. I want to tap into something else now is some of your recent work. So I remember seeing you on TV and I don't know if you're allowed to talk about it, but I'm going to ask you about it anyway. So what were you doing? In Anthony Joshua's corner. Ah, uh, well, um, yeah. I mean, I'm 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 one of Anthony Joshua's coaches, and um, yeah, it was just a great honour to be asked. Um, Benjamin always tells the funny story of Anthony Joshua is, is 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 obviously an incredible athlete, and um, I'm blessed to be helping him. And I'm blessed to be around these incredible athletes and, and see what makes them tick. And Anthony Joshua has got that curiosity of that seven-year-old that we spoke about. He's carried that on. And so much so that he would be up at um, Sheffield and um, he asks questions all the time. He's got an incredible thirst for curiosity. And of course, he would ask Benjamin, um, how come you do this and how come you do that? And and Benjamin said, well, I do it like this and I do it like that. And after a bit, I don't know, Benjamin tells the story far better than I can, but he obviously got bored and said, listen, this is how my coach tells me to do it. And um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I got it, you know, um, AJ used to ask me questions, you know, um, and the, I'll tell you a funny one is that he used to ask me questions under an alias 
on Inst- on Instagram, and uh, people I, people weren't meant to know it was him, but somebody told me it was him. So he's asking me these questions, and I'm pretending he's he's pretending to be somebody else. somebody else, and I'm pretending that I don't know it's him, and I'm just replying to these questions, and it was quite comical at the time. Um, but yeah, so I'm so I'm blessed to be to be part of his team, and I'm blessed to be um, looking to develop him um, onto the next level. It was a great honour to be part of that. So obviously, with that sort of stage or platform do you get other fighters trying to approach you and how do you manage yeah, the I, workload I, I do I do get um, a lot of approaches and and basically my focus has always been with Benjamin okay he is my number one focus you know to make Benjamin a Hall of Fame fighter that is my number one focus um, and that has really motivated so much of my training over the last 10 years. And it's, it's, um, it's motivated so much of my own progression over the last 10 years. Um, and then now I've taken on um, the, the work commitments of, of AJ. And, um, and I say to AJ, because even AJ says to me, oh, this boxer asked if you'd help. And I said, AJ, I'm not being funny, but my goal is Benjamin and to make you an all time great. And I said, that's going to take a lot of time. Okay. Those two things take a lot of time. And I've also got a family and I also work with other amateur boxers. So I have to really be strict with people because I realize that it takes so much energy. It takes so much time in order to, in order to get to where we want to get to. And what's the future got for yourself? So after boxing, what would you like to do? Um, phew, after boxing, crikey! Or would you never hang up? No, I don't think I would. I, I, I don't. I don't think I would. I don't think I'd like to. As as my mind is now, I wake up and I think about how to be a better coach. I go to bed thinking about how to be a better coach. Um, you know, I study all the time. Um, I have a one of my favourite things is to buy rare books, and I buy rare books on coaching from from the forties and the fifties and the sixties and and whenever, and I'm, I'm always looking to educate myself um, to become a better teacher. So, and boxing just happens to be the medium that, 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 that I use in order to teach. Um, so I wouldn't like to think of a time after boxing, really, in, in truthfully, I would always like to be doing something, working with people, as long as they're dedicated, as long as I'm dedicated, as long as I'm working with dedicated students, um, then, then that's a real joy to me. That's, that, that is my joy. So for the final segment, you're going to have the stage to speak to the X number of people watching this. What's your final advice, word of warning, anything you want to say to motivate people to chase their dreams and sort of align that karma to hit the best it can be? Um, just to say really that y- you can do it. Really, you can do it. I mean, my father was an actor and that was his passion. That was his drive, even though everybody told him that he needed to pack it in and get a proper job. Um, But he always supported me in my passion. And there's been plenty of times where I've been a boxing coach and I have had no money. And there's been plenty of times where I've had um, little opportunities but I've always developed that passion through the tough times and the good times um, to get to where I am now. And I think that's the thing that, you know, this life is such a blessing. And now I'm at a point where I realize those tough times, they've helped me. And I realize the good times have helped me as well, but in a different way. Okay, so I've got to that point now where I realize all of the experiences, good and bad, are blessings um, and because they're all lessons. Every, every day is a lesson. And if you treat life like that, if you treat life like it is a blessing and it is a lesson, then you can only get better and you can only further yourself. Yeah.